So let's start with the meditation in the open way. Just lift your tongue a couple of centimeters. Feel the power around the tongue, the chi, the life force. And imagine this is the handle of the pump that you're about to operate. The breath is like the tube going down into the well. The well below the breath, the source of your chi, the life force, the center of your being, infinite well of the waters of life. And using this, using the breath, you draw the life force up from the well and distribute it through the tongue to shower, to fill your whole being with the power of life. Become fulfilled. And enjoy the bliss in your breath as I continue to teach the physics of the quantum vortex. The great tragedy in physics is the way the vortex model for matter was abandoned. It was abandoned because the vortex atom theory of the 19th century couldn't explain the way energy is absorbed and admitted by matter. And yet you will see as I'm working through this subject how the fault wasn't with the vortex theory, the fault with was with the fact that the vortex theory was applied at the wrong level. It was applied to the atom and not the subatomic particles. And this was not the fault of the physicists. They were not to know that the atom was going to be split into smaller particles. That happened in the 20th century. The tragedy was that the vortex theory was not applied to subatomic particles. And as a result of this, we have a quantum theory, quantum mechanics, which is unintelligible. As Richard Feynman said, we don't understand quantum mechanics, we just get used to it. I mean, what good is the subject if people can't understand it? It works. But you see, there's something else Richard Feynman said. He said, of nuclear energy, we have the formulas for that, but not the fundamental understandings. We don't know what it is. Well, in this episode, I'm going to tell you what nuclear energy is. And I'm going to do it using the vortex physics to show you how powerful the vortex theory is in terms of our fundamental understandings of physics when it's applied to the subatomic particles. So in the last episode, I was talking about the interactions between the quantum waves of energy and the quantum vortices of energy. So what happens here is that the energy is spinning to form the quantum vortex in three dimensions to form the corpuscular subatomic particle. And the extension of this vortex energy into infinity sets up space. 
So there's no difference between space and matter. They're the same thing, except space is sparse matter. It's spread out vortex energy. Whereas the particle of matter, subatomic particle, is dense space. It's dense spiral energy. And it tends to be more of, of a spiral. The, the further you go into the centre, the spiral gets tighter. Whereas out here, the, the ball of wool model shows that the the, the, the vortex tends to be concentric spheres of energy growing and shrinking more than a vortex as you get further and further out from the centre. Now, last week I spoke about the interactions between electrons, which are light vortices, and quanta of energy, but now I'm going to talk about the interactions between protons, which are nearly 2,000 times as massive as electrons. That is, they have about 2,000 times as much energy spinning in them as in, a, in, in an electron vortex. And that spin sets up a lot more inertia. And in last, the last episode, I drew an analogy of the electron vortex unable to resist the impact of a wave, quantum wave, a bit like hammering a nail into a sheet on a washing line. The sheet goes ahead of the nail as you try to hammer it in. And so most of the quantum is sticking out of the electron, only the tip of it gets tangled in. And, and that's why you've got this wavy tail driving the vortex forward. But when it comes to the proton because it's so much more massive it's got much more static inertia than the electron so there's your massive proton with its static inertia and it's rather like a gatepost which can withstand the impact of the hammered nail and so it's easy to drive the nail into the gatepost. It's easy to drive a complete quantum into a proton. And just as the gatepost is more massive for the extra weight of the nail that's gone into it, the mass of the nail that's gone into it, so the proton is more massive for the, the um, quantum it's caught. Now, protons are much older than the universe. The universe is about 13 billion years old, whereas the estimated lifespan of a proton is in the order of hundreds of trillions of trillions of years. In, in, in fact, a proton decay, spontaneous proton decay has never been observed. So as far as we're concerned, they're infinite in their lifespan. So in that infinity of time, they've had ample opportunity to absorb as much energy, which I call captured energy, as they can. So this is what I call complete capture because all the quantum is swirling around inside the proton vortex. So when you measure the mass of a proton, you're not just measuring the mass of that basic proton vortex, you're measuring the mass of the captured energy as well, which is called the meson energy. And the way to imagine this is imagine the proton vortex, something like candy floss, which is a bit, it's a big empty sort of wobbly vortex, if you like. But then the captured energy fills that space and instead it turns into a gobstopper. I used to suck, I don't know whether they have those still now, but I used to love them. Great big candy balls with a little bit of aniseed at the center. We call them gobstoppers. Anyway, that's it's it's that ability of the it's the extent of the ability of the proton vortex to capture energy that, def that gives it its diam a diameter because th that is a threshold. It's a mathematical parameter which is suddenly it stops. Suddenly there it can hold the captured energy, and out there it can't. You see, so the the um, completely capped energy. So th that gives you, if you like, the 
the hard, corpuscular, round, measurable proton. You can actually measure its diameter. Whereas most of the proton vortex extends on out into infinity. Now, just as you can move a gatepost with a tractor, hit it hard enough, and it'll move forward in tractor motion going over the bumps. So if you hit one of these protons hard enough, it, you know, once it's got completely captured energy, it will move in wave motion as well. So you can get proton wave particles as well, but that's more in high energy physics. But getting back to nuclear energy, explaining that. So you've got a, the proton vortex, which is saturated with captured energy. And you've got another proton vortex saturated with captured energy. And they tend to repel because they're both positive charges. But if you drive them together with an immense force, such as you have in the sun or in the hydrogen bomb, then they bang together and fuse. What happens is they converge. And as they converge, there's less space now because they're pushed into each other. And the some of the captured energy is just a little bit more than half a percent is released. as nuclear energy. And it's that release of nuclear energy that we can explain, that, that, that that's the energy of the hydrogen bomb, energy of the sun. But we can explain it with this model. It's so simple. You just slam two vortices together. There's less space now to hold the captured energy and some of it is evicted and escapes as nuclear energy. Meanwhile, the majority of the captured energy left behind swirls between the two nuclear, the two protons in the nucleus and binds them together. That's the strong nuclear force. So that's nuclear fusion that happens in the hydrogen bomb. What happens in the atomic bomb, the bomb they used at Hiroshima, where they split uranium or plutonium, is that in the uranium or plutonium, they're very big nuclei, and the protons and neutrons are moving around quite loosely. But if you split them in half and form, you, get, you end up with two smaller nuclei, strontium or iodine, and the subatomic particles, the protons and neutrons in those smaller nuclei are more tightly bound together. So what happens, you split the uranium or plutonium and the fragments go clunk like that. They sort of pull together like that. And as they pull together, okay, some of the captured energy, it's like they're squeezed together. It's, it's squeezed out, it's evicted. And that's the nuclear energy of nuclear fission, of the fission bomb that was used over Hiroshima. But what happens is that the remaining captured energy that binds all those nuclear particles together is racing around in a shorter track than it was in the uranium or plutonium nuclei. So you get tighter bonding, you see. And that is why the bonding, the binding between the nuclear particles increases when you lose the energy. And this is a mystery to physicists. It's like, how does that happen? When you lose some of the glue, the, the bonding gets tighter. <laughs> I mean, no, it's because the racetrack is shorter. Therefore, the same energy is, is going in a shorter circuit and therefore it's a stronger bind. So this is the power of the vortex theory. It just makes physics really easy to understand. I'm going to give you an analogy to help you understand nuclear energy. It's called the hedgehog analogy. 
if you throw two hedgehogs together, hedgehogs are difficult to get together because of their prickles. That's like the positive charge repulsion. But if you throw them together with another force so that the prickles converge, some of the fleas on the hedgehogs are evicted. You see, hedgehogs are full of fleas. The hedgehogs don't invite the fleas. The fleas just jump on board. So it is the vortex doesn't in, doesn't sort of pull in the energy of the quantum. The quantum drives into it. All the action is taken by the quantum, of wave quantum driving into the vortex. But anyway, you've got these two hedgehogs. They're more tightly they're, they're converged, and so some of the Fleas are evicted by in the convergence, and that represents the nuclear energy. And now we've got the converged hedgehogs. And what happens is the remaining fleas, not being bothered about which back they bite, hop from hop, hog to hog, hop from hog to hog, bind them together. So that's the hedgehog analogy for nuclear energy and the strong nuclear force. So Moving on, there is another um, process that's been going on in physics called high energy physics, which I want to talk about now. And in order to give you an understanding of high energy physics, I need to present to you with the two quantum laws of motion I've formulated. And you see, when you start a theory, you have to you start with your axioms and the axioms you don't have to explain. What you have to do is put forward the axioms of your theory and then use those axioms to explain everything. And the more things you can explain with your axioms, the more successful the theory is. So the axioms of um, the vortex theory is that particles of energy maintain their wave or vortex form of motion unless change is forced upon them. If the change is removed, then they immediately revert back to their original form of motion. So that those are the two, two laws. The first law is that you can force change upon a form of energy. So you can force a wave into vortex motion. But as soon as that force is removed, immediately that transitional vortex that will revert back to the waveform. So what's been happening in high energy physics is that physicists blast atomic nuclei with vast amounts of energy high energy physics and at CERN they've got these in these um two great big rings and they accelerate the particles in these race tracks faster and faster and faster until they're going nearly at the speed of light and then smash them together in a hedgehog in a head-on not hedgehog a head-on collision bang all right and what they find is that the energy in the the energy of, of 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 the acceleration doesn't stop when the particles slam in together the energy goes on and the energy passes through the nuclear particles as though they are dyes so i'm just going to show you a a cosmic ray picture. This is one of the earliest pictures, which is the Nobel Prize winning picture taken by Cecil Powell of Bristol University. He sent plates up into the upper atmosphere, photographic plates, and sent hundreds of thousands of plates up until he saw what he was looking for, which was a very rare event, which is a cosmic ray particle with colossal amount of energy slamming into the nucleus of a silver atom in the photographic emulsion. And what happened is that 140 new particles called pi mesons 
emerge on the other side. And in fact, what these were, the, in the explosion, the energy came in, drove out all the captured energy, the meson energy I spoke of earlier, out of the protons in the nucleus of the atom. And they came, all that captured energy that had been spinning around for trillions of years inside the nucleus came out. And in trillionths of a second, 10 to the minus 15, in trillionths of a second, they unraveled from their spiral state and disappeared in the waveform. It's like they were prisoners. They'd, this captured energy had been imprisoned inside the nucleus of that atom for billions of years. Suddenly it breaks free. And I mean, they're not going to hang around as vortices. They're off as waves. The natural form of, 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 of motion. So this is the basis of high energy physics. The feature of high energy physics is that the particles that they produce in high energy physics are very short lived. And this is the quantum laws of motion in operation. As soon as the captured energy is released from capture, it immediately reverts back to the waveform, its natural waveform, and radiates away as heat and light. So I hope you've enjoyed this session on nuclear energy, high energy physics. And in the next session, I'm going to tell you more about the mistakes, the errors in quantum mechanics as it stands. It's incomprehensible, but at the same time, there's a major flaw in quantum mechanics. That is the principle, the bind, foundation principle of quantum mechanics put forward by Werner Heisenberg called the uncertainty principle was actually disproved in 1935 by a discovery at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge. It's very interesting. The British, based at Cambridge and, and Manchester and other great universities, but mainly Cambridge at the Cavendish Laboratory. A professor of physics there, J.J. Thompson, who discovered the electron, was a proponent of the vortex theory. He taught it, Cambridge, to 1910. And then the British physics was dismissed by the Europeans. So the epicentre of physics moved from Cambridge to Copenhagen, And then, 10 years or so later, well, 10 to 15 years later, in 1935, it was a discovery back at Cambridge that blew out the quantum theory, the quantum mechanics of the Copenhagen Institute. But you see, the British play cricket by the rules. When the... British scientists with their vortex atom theory were unable to explain what they call spectral lines, which is the way that atoms absorb and emit energy. They abandoned the theory, which is the right thing to do. If your theory can't explain the facts, it's the theory that's wrong. You've got to ditch it. And then Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist, used quantum theory to explain the way that electrons absorb and lose energy in the atom. He explained those spectral lines in the quantum leap, which I talked about. But he didn't use a vortex theory for that. And so successful, so much momentum by his explaining the atom formed of subatomic particles of electrons orbiting protons and neutrons in the nucleus. 
is that he took the, the whole centre of physics with him to Copenhagen, to the University of Copenhagen. And he assembled a group of physicists around him, the best of the brains he could find, to formulate quantum mechanics. And one of them, a young German called Werner Heisenberg, needed a good idea. He was on a payroll. He had to come up with a smart idea. And he came up with the uncertainty principle. And then it was disproved. It was proved wrong in 1935 by a new particle discovered by James Chadwick at the Cavendish Laboratory in Cambridge, you see. But the Europeans don't play cricket. They don't know the rules. That if your theory can't explain the facts, if it doesn't fit the facts, the theory's wrong. And what they did is they buried the facts. They ignored the facts. And don't forget, ignorance is derived from the verb to ignore. I tell you, quantum mechanics, quantum theory, physics is pervaded by ignorance where they ignore inconvenient facts because they ignored the implications of this discovery at Cambridge to protect their precious theory, to protect this principle of uncertainty. And in the next episode, I'm going to reveal that fraud, quantum fraud, that cover-up, that lack of integrity in physics. So I look forward to you joining me in my next talk. And don't forget the open way. Namaste.